So what's the best steroid ester? Do you like Sipionate or Enethate? Are you old school and prefer Sustanon 250 or good old Omnitrends? Or are you more of a daily propionate kind of guy so you can get the highest milligram amount of steroid after the ester has been metabolized? You'll know the answers and so much more at the end of this video. Vigorously, here, so there's actually a boatload of different steroid ester formulations out there, many of which you've probably never even heard about or will ever get a chance to try yourself. So here's a quick list of all of the steroid esters which were available at one point or another, some of which are still being marketed, while others have already been discontinued, so you'll probably never get a chance to use them yourself. Here you can see on the list a couple of familiar ones. We have acetate, benzoate, caproate, sipionate, the canoate, enanthate, and then we get into the little bit more obscure esters like uh, hexahydrobenzyl carbonate used in the parabolin ampules, isocuproate, phenylpropionate, propionate, undecanoate, and undesinate. So for the sake of this video, let's just focus on those commonly known and loved steroid esters, the steroid esters that we actually have access to. So what's your favorite steroid ester off this list? Let me guess. It's trembolone acetate. So of all of the commonly used steroid esters, most of the esters might have one, two, three, sometimes four steroid formulations. You can see that acetate and enthate is being used in four different steroid formulations. But most of the other esters being used maybe once, twice, going on three times in several steroid formulations. So some of these esters are not as versatile. They uh, don't seem to be commonly used, whereas other ones, again, acetate or enthate, very commonly used. I right, keep this in mind when you go through your product selection. And keep in mind that Sustanon 250 and Omnidrens actually contain propionate, phenylpropionate, isocuproate, and the canoate. So you get four different steroid esters in one product. But Steve, what do these steroid esters actually do? I'm glad you asked. Esters make steroids more lipophilic, allowing them to be dissolved in oil, which we can then inject intramuscularly or subcutaneously. Now, that doesn't mean that the esterified steroid perfectly dissolves in a matched carrier oil. There's still a risk that this ester formulation crashes or crystallizes out of solution as the temperature goes down. And this is more apparent at higher concentrations. So you see that most of the pharmaceutical companies use a good amount of benzyl benzoate to kind of keep their steroid formulations in solution, preventing them from crashing. And some underground labs prefer to keep the benzyl benzoate content of their steroid formulas quite low, and then they might use ethyl oleate or another solvent, which is synthetic and highly inflammatory, to prevent this steroid formula from crashing, right? So when the pharmaceutical companies use benzyl benzoate, it might be 20, 25% of the complete volume of the product that you're injecting. And keep in mind that benzyl benzoate also acts as a pro-drug delivery mechanism, allowing for, well, 20 to 25% of the uh, esterified steroids, which is contained within the product, to be absorbed within the first one to two days. And this is why, generally speaking, you see serum concentrations of testosterone or other steroid formulas rise within the first one or two days, regardless of the ester, regardless of the carrier oil, because it's the benzyl benzoate that helps with drug delivery. And on the subject of carrier oils, and don't worry, we'll do a separate carrier oil deep dive very, very soon, so subscribe now so you don't miss it. Carrier oils also influence the half-life. When you inject a carrier oil, it goes into the injection depot, and besides the ester that influences the half-life of a particular steroid, the carrier oil also influences that. So it might mean that the carrier oil, the injection depot, gets absorbed within one day up to 34 days, right? Keep this in mind when you start deciding which steroid ester formulation to go with. Not only the ester is important, but also the carrier oil. More on that in a separate video. Once the esterified steroid is liberated from the injection depot, it enters systemic circulation, and then the ester which is attached to the steroid is metabolized by esterases, one carbon atom, at a time. Different esters have different amount of carbon atoms, and generally speaking, the more carbon atoms an ester contains, the longer it takes for esterases to metabolize the ester away completely, which ultimately liberates the steroid molecule, and it's a steroid molecule that can actually bind to the androgen receptor. Esterified steroids cannot interact with the androgen receptor, right? So you still need to go through this metabolic process 
making an esterified steroid biologically active. More specifically, carboxyl esterases metabolize the carbon atoms away from the esterified steroids. And carboxyl esterases are actually a super family of esterases. There's many different kinds. Carboxyl esterases are predominantly found in the liver, the kidneys, adipose tissue, the intestinal tract, and even the brain. But it seems that the liver is the primary location where the esterified steroids are metabolized into biologically active steroids. But this can also occur in other tissues, even within red blood cells. The half-life of a steroid is somewhat directly correlated to the amount of carbon atom that each steroid ester contains. Keep in mind that the injection depot, particularly the carrier oil, also contributes to how fast or how slow a particular steroid ester is liberated, which also influences the half-life. And then it matters if you do intramuscular or subcutaneous administration. If you do intramuscular administration, there's even a difference between the intramuscular injection site, right? As an example, deltoid administrations seem to absorb and metabolize faster compared to glute administrations, albeit that glute administrations can also hold a significantly higher injection volume, up to three milliliters, whereas deltoids I would limit to one cc per site. Your individual carboxyl esterase enzyme activity highly determines how you metabolize the esters from the steroid parent hormone. And this also means that the carboxyl esterases that you have more of, again, carboxyl esterases are a group of different enzymes. If you have a lot of a certain carboxyl esterase that seems to prefer enantate metabolism, then you as an individual should go with enantate. And if you have carboxyl esterases that seem to favor cypionate metabolism, go with cypionate. The only real way of figuring out which esters your individual carboxyl esterases prefer is through self-experimentation. Get your hands dirty. Give acetate a try for a month, then propionate for a month, enantate for a month, cypionate for a month, right? Exact same milligram dosages, injection frequency, same injection depth, if possible, same carrier oil. Get your hands dirty, figure it out. The results will speak for themselves. And then you stick with the esters that your body agrees with. And the amount of carbon atoms that a steroid ester contains also determine how lipophilic this particular formulation is going to be. So again, generally speaking, steroid ester formulations with less carbon atoms allow for concentrations, let's say 25 milligrams per one milliliter, 50 milligrams per one milliliter, up to 100 milligrams per one milliliter. This is very common for acetate and propionate esters. And the more carbon atoms an ester contains, cypionate, enantate, decanoate, undecanoate, and distillinate, these all allow for concentrations, let's say 200 milligrams per one milliliter, 250 milligrams per one milliliter, 300 milligrams per one milliliter, right? So the more carbon atoms a, a steroid ester contains, the more lipophilic it's going to be. And as a quick side tangent, phenylpropionate, cypionate, and hexahydrobenzocarbonate have a cyclical benzyl structure at the end of the ester, which also affects esterase metabolism and how lipophilic this esterified steroid formulation can actually be. So let's have a quick look and see how many carbon atoms each steroid ester actually contains. As you go down the list, you see that carbon atoms are somewhat correlated to its half-life, but that isn't always the case because phenylpropionate with nine carbon atoms has only a three-day half-life compared to hexahydrobenzocarbonate with eight carbon atoms has an eight-day half-life. Both have a cyclical benzyl structure. What's going on here? Well, that's the carrier oil, right? All of these uh, half-lives have been determined in certain carrier oils, in certain injection frequency and injection depths. And unfortunately, none of that has been standardized, similar to the anabolic to androgenic ratings, right? So uh, take the half-life with a grain of salt, regardless of ester, you should inject every single day. If you inject every single day, you get the most stable serum concentrations and the most anabolic response because there's less fluctuations in between the peaks and valleys. And it's in these peaks and valleys that metabolism occurs, especially of testosterone, right? In the peak of testosterone in serum, it metabolizes into estradiol and dihydrotestosterone. And then if we scroll down the list and we look at undecanoate with 11 carbon atoms, we see a range of half-lives between 20.9 days up to 33.9 days. 20.9 days has been determined in tea oil and 33.9 days has been determined in castor oil. All right, so besides the carboxyl esterase activity and besides the injection depth, 
the carrier oil highly determines what the half-life of a particular steroid ester is going to be. That's all fine and dandy, Steve, but what does it even matter if I do daily subcutaneous microadministrations? Well, in that case, it doesn't really matter at all. Serum levels will be stable, regardless of the ester that you're taking or multitude of different esters that you're taking, regardless of your individual carboxyl esterase activity. If you do daily microadministrations, whether those are intramuscular or subcutaneous, levels will be stable. What does matter is the total net amount of actual testosterone or other anabolic androgenic steroids that you get for the amount of milligrams of this astrophyte steroid formulation that you're injecting. Keep in mind, whatever you're administering has an active pharmaceutical ingredient and the ester, the ester determines the half-life, the active life, how long it stays within your body and the active pharmaceutical ingredient being testosterone or testosterone derivative can actually bind to the androgen receptor. This is what we're after, right? The pharmacodynamics might change with different esters, but it's the actual testosterone that does all the magic. So unfortunately, the active pharmaceutical ingredient is only a certain percentage of the amount of milligrams that you inject and the ester makes up the rest of the percentage ending up at 100%. So if you inject 250 milligrams testosterone enantate, for example, you're not getting 250 milligrams actual testosterone, you only get 72% of that because the other 28% is enantate. So if you inject 250 milligrams testosterone enantate, that's 180 milligrams actual net testosterone. As always, I did all of the calculations so you don't have to because different steroid molecules have different molecular weights and it affects the percentage of which the active pharmaceutical ingredient compared to the ester ends up at. All of the results are on the screen for the commonly used esterified steroid formulations. So you see that acetate fluctuates anywhere, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, between let's say 86.5% up to 87.8% and the rest is acetate. And as we go down the list, you see that cypionate is around 70% active pharmaceutical ingredient. The canoate, about 65% active pharmaceutical ingredient. Enethate, let's say 72% API. Hexahydrobenzocarbonate found in parabolin ampules, 66% trembolone. Now we can go further and further down the list, but as you can easily tell, the longer a steroid ester is, the longer its half-life or the more amount of carbon atoms it contains, the less net anabolic androgenic steroids that you get for each milligram of the injection that takes place. So this might factor into your decision-making process. If you want the most amount of uh, net anabolic androgenic steroid for every injection that you do, you have to go with shorter esters. That being the acetate esters or suspensions where you get 100% of the active pharmaceutical ingredient, but unfortunately, testosterone suspension, tremolone suspension, sinazole, winsterol suspension, post-injection pain, for days. But if you can trade in a little bit of active pharmaceutical ingredient to reduce the post-injection pain, not take it away completely, we still want the most amount of API, look no further than acetate with 87% bang for your buck, right? 87% active pharmaceutical ingredient or propionate, which is 84% active pharmaceutical ingredient. I think those two will give you the best results for the amount of milligrams that you inject but you would still have to go with daily subcutaneous microadministrations because these esters have reasonably short half-lives and in many cases they're suspended in MCT oil or other carrier oils which disperse and metabolize from the injection depot quite rapidly. So what's the best steroid ester then, Steve? Please let us know. Well, it kind of depends on your individual metabolism and individual needs. If you want to go with injection convenience and you want to stick with the bi-weekly administrations, let's say Monday, Friday, for example, I would recommend cypionate, enantate, undecanoate, decanoate, or sustenon 250, right? Those allow for two administrations per week if and only if the carrier oil that it's suspended in leaves the injection depot reasonably slow, right? But we'll make a separate video about that. So if cypionate, enantate, decanoate, undecanoate, sustenon 250 is brewed in MCT oil, I would do daily micro administrations, right? The carrier oil highly plays into the half-life of whatever ester it is that you're injecting. If you want the most bang for your buck though, I would recommend you to stick to esters with a reasonably short half-life, less carbon atoms, so you get more milligrams of active pharmaceutical ingredients. So that's acetate first, propionate second, and enantate third. The difference between acetate, propionate, and enantate is that acetate and propionate generally are brewed in concentrations of 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams per one milliliter. But enethate is great because it's brewed up to 250, sometimes 300 milligrams per one milliliter. 
So if you now go with the amount of milligrams that you're injecting for and compare that to the injection depot, the volume, the amount of milliliters in the injection depot, Enantate wins. Because the injection depot is low, you can pick and choose your carrier oil, but you get the most amount of milligrams for that uh, trace minute amount of injection depot that takes place. All right, so of course we're splitting hairs now. Before you start asking, are we now going to calculate away the ester weight and go with the, the net milligrams of active pharmaceutical ingredient when we start comprising our weekly steroid dosages. Look at it this way, all right? Before you get too excited, look at it this way. When you talk about your income, do you mention your income before or after taxes, all right? In many cases, you want the income to look a little bit more appealing than the net amount of actual income that you get. We mention our income before taxes. As an example, let's say you make $100,000 per year, but you pay 35% taxes and now you're left with $65,000. What are you going to tell people? I make $65,000 or you make $100,000 and the government takes a percentage of that away. Steroids are exactly the same, right? You go with the weekly dose, active pharmaceutical ingredients and ester included. So if you run 500 milligrams testosterone inotate, that's 500 milligrams testosterone inotate, giving you a net 360 milligrams testosterone, the 360 milligrams testosterone that you can detect in serum. It's very easy to keep track of your steroid dosages if you go with the active pharmaceutical ingredient and the ester attached, right? These are the milligram dosages, the concentrations that you find in the medical inserts on the product packaging, on the vials or ampules. And these are the milligrams that you're going to calculate into your weekly steroid intake, right? And if you beat the game of taxes or you got corporations all over the world and you know how to minimize taxes, then stick with acetate or suspensions, bro, but get ready for a lifetime of post-injection pain. In the process of figuring out which ester works best for you, you're going to have to do blood work quite frequently. And if you live in the United States, look no further than Merrick Health. They have very comprehensive blood work analysis and excellent healthcare providers who can help you interpret your blood work results. So as you're going down the list of esters, uh, maybe you experiment with enotate for a while, then propionates, then sipionate, right? Up to your preference. Do blood work in between. Do it over at Merrick Health. I have a discount code for 10%. You can use it as many times as you like. Save yourself a little bit of money in the process. And then as you go down the blood work list and analyses, at one point you'll figure out that enotate is also best for you, most likely. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. A front double bicep for you guys. Subscribe now if you haven't already because when the carry oil deep dive video drops, you'll never look at anabolic androgenic steroid products the same. I promise you. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video dropping soon.